hopefully, but we're going to audible a little bit and shift over to Jacob. So team Jacobs, are y'all there? And are you, uh, are you ready? Hi, Ben. Um, I'm here. I'm Hi, sure. Neil. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, Thanks so for having us. Absolutely. So y'all, uh, if y'all have a, uh, a, a deck to run, you, you, uh, Y'all can go ahead and, and pick which, which one you want to drive, and it'll, mm -hmm. it'll broadcast out. I hope I'm sharing my screen okay. Sure. Screen okay. There it is, yep. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll get started. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us here. My name is Nino Harishvili, and together with my colleague, Keith Christoph, I'll be talking about Jacobs' approach to health system resilience and rapid decision-making tool. But before I jump into the presentation, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a medical doctor by training, and over a decade or so, I have been working on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases and countering weapons of mass destruction around the world. I have been advising the Department of Defense on how to strengthen public and veterinary health systems around the world and make them more resilient to withstand various shocks and attacks whether it's man-made or naturally occurring. So let me tell you this. Uh, let me advance the slide first. Let me tell you this. The coronavirus pandemic that we are currently experiencing today has revealed deficiencies in how we deliver public health services around the world and in the United States. It shows that we are actually not well prepared to withstand the onslaught of emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases and that we have to do something about it. A few notable issues um, are healthcare facility and infrastructure related supply chain problems, willing and able healthcare workers to do the job when we need them, and proper treatment and care protocols. It's not an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to mention some challenges that we have experienced here. I would like to pause here and say with confidence that uh, if we build and maintain resilient health systems, we will be able to withstand the rebound from the future events like this, like COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying health system resilience, the, we talk about the resilience. So I would like to uh, take a moment and explain what it is. So according to the World Health Organization, health system resilience is defined as the capacity of a system to absorb, adapt, anticipate, and transform when exposed to external threats and to forecast shocks that bring about new challenges and opportunities. And at the same time, still retain control, control over its remit and pursuit of its primary objectives and functions, which is to deliver healthcare. Well, it's easier said than done, right? So at Jacobs, we created the health system resilience framework, and we use this standardized and holistic approach to prepare our partners and customers for unknown public health events. We address resilience from many angles, and those angles are shown on your presentation on your screen on the right-hand side as a form of a wheel. We identified eight core competencies, and they include everything uh, starting from development of emergency preparedness and pandemic preparedness plans for COVID-19, that's number one on the wheel, to logistics and supply chain management, to risk and vulnerability and technical capacity assessments of various components of healthcare system, to information systems and data analysis. Last but not least, number eight, is a healthcare workforce training and exercise. One of the prominent components of our health resilience framework is number three on the wheel, and that's a healthcare infrastructure services where we support our customers with a full life cycle of designing, developing, constructing, and commissioning healthcare facilities. And my coworker, Keats, will take over uh, right now, and uh, she will talk about one of our COVID-19 related solutions that we are talking about inside the company. And this is the component, this is uh, one of the solutions that we came up as a part of the health, resili health system resilience uh, framework. Keats, would you like to take over? Of course, thanks, Dino. First of all, and thank you, Ben and Tim. Thank you, mayors. Thank you, commissioners, community members, and peers. It's really an honor. <clears throat> it's really an honor to be here today. Um, as Nino said, I'm Kitz Kristoff, and I, overse I oversee growth and sales in our people, places, and solutions business. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool that we developed, a rapid decision-making tool, 
that's really related specifically to the healthcare infrastructure services that Nino uh, first talked about. Um, we've been working in healthcare systems in, in a myriad of different ways, um, from designing mechanical systems to, to you know, designing hospitals to uh, overseeing construction. And so we really um, were in a unique position to draw from our experience there and also combine that with our experience in emergency management. And so our emergency management teams that work very, very closely with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers really collaborated to help within the context of the, of the pandemic and specifically in the surge planning that went on. And I'm gonna talk about um, the rapid decision-making tool, but really number one is really framing the problem. So we know the problem in terms of the, the pandemic, but we're gonna frame the problem within the context of the surge planning and the lack of beds across the world um, that we were seeing as it related to the studies and the, and the planning. Um, so that's really framing the problem. We really have a lack of beds, whether it's high acuity beds, low acuity beds. And we really need a specific and unique solution to every different scenario. Um, we can't look at this as really a one size fits all. Every system, every municipality, every country is a little bit different in what their, requ in what their requirements are. And so this is really to compress uh, the process of that, which could be a long process, but in the state of an emergency, you've got to really accelerate that. So secondly, we've defined the problem that we need to look at acuity beds. We need to look at acuity models and really determine um, of all of the models, what really are the ones that fit each specific you know, client. And in the development of alternatives, those really are the models. So some of those models are high acuity, um, negative pressure. Um, I'll give you one example, the Cura model that was used in Italy that was really designed um, from a shipping container and created negative pressure, worked and performed very, very well. It was only one of several alternatives that we actually looked at. Um, we also determined that within the context of acuity models that there, there were five key factors that were really shared across all municipalities, countries, or private uh, uh, public healthcare systems. And those factors I'll talk about in just a minute. And then finally, we looked at classification. And the need to look at classification really reminds us there are compliance issues around classification if it's a government entity there are uh, requirements and compliance issues that we need to work through. So let's move on to the five factors in the RDM. I, I promise you, I'm not gonna go through this, this whole thing. I know it's a little bit early for this and there's a lot on the page and I'm just gonna really highlight the RDM. But I wanna talk just a little bit about this key factors that we found that were really universal. And one was time. How much time in totality will it take to get these units on site and operational? The second is again, going back to those regulation requirements. Certain states have requirements, certain countries have requirements and certain systems have requirements. Um, reuse was a consideration that everyone wanted to look at. What is the ability to reuse these units, these investments? How easily can they be reused? How easily can they be stored? And what is the viability or lifespan of them in going forward? The next was scale. A lot of companies were able to produce a few models, but that just wasn't a solution. So scale became a really important driving factor. Scale, how many can be produced for a certain situation? And the final one is space. And I'm gonna just stop for a second on space because you know, you've heard across the, really the world, um, different facilities and spaces that, that these units have gone into. You know, some of them have been in convention centers, quite frankly, in gyms. Um, open, you know, really open air facilities. And some of them that we've done have been in really in, in hospitals that were not operational, that we went back and retrofitted a hospital to make it actually operational for COVID-19. They could be attached to an existing hospital or they could go inside an existing hospital, including inpatient, depending on the model. And then of course, you know, the hospitality area, you know, could hotels and dorms serve for what kinds of circumstances. So this is kind of a snapshot into CBA. Um, I want to stop and just say that CBA isn't, isn't really um, 
designed in a vacuum. It's a model that can be applied to a lot of different circumstances. And right now we're looking at RDM for our testing facilities. We're designing and building testing facilities. And so the RDM is gonna be very, very useful in looking at all the models for that as well. Just finally, I'd like to end with, you know, three additional initiatives that we're looking at right now um, that are, you know, apply to COVID-19 I wanna share with you. So we actually work own, uh, we operate and maintain over 70 wastewater treatment plants across the country. And so we've now partnered with epidemiologists at higher ed institutions, academia, and tech companies really to look at epidemiology, surveillance, and response. And we're looking really at how sewage can reveal the true scale of the coronavirus outbreak and provide a qualitative picture of the virus in our communities, diminishing regrowth and eradication. We really wanted to be able to develop long-term trends and early warning systems. So that's, that's an initiative that we're working on right now. We're also looking at mass testing and mass vaccination. We do a lot of work in the life sciences with biotech and pharma. And so we're collaborating with them on the notion that we're really going to have to mass produce vaccines and we're also obviously going to have to mass test. And so really that becomes a big event, a big you know, world event. And so how can we organize plan and manage what would be what will be a very, very big event. And then finally, we're looking, we've got an initiative uh, actually being worked on in the UK, patient to passenger, really looking at our market sector leaders and mass transit, rail and aviation. How can we develop and grow back the consumer confidence within the transportation and mass transit industry? So those are three initiatives. So that's it. Thank you very much.